Today on A Couple of Pointers Podcast, we're lucky enough to have Brendan Fallot, Revenue Operations Manager for File Invite. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ricky. Good to be here. For the sake of the audience, explain it like we five. What do you do and what does File Invite do? My job here at File Invite is really to tie together what we're doing in sales from an operations point of view with what the CS team needs from us, what they're doing, and also what the marketing team is doing. So we're all pointing in the same direction and operating off a sort of common understanding of who we're dealing with and the strategy behind it. What we do here at File Invite is if you think about any time someone's asking you for a lot of documentation, that's the type of situation we get involved in. A lot of the time people are asking you for information by email, not because of the, they've made a conscious decision to use email, but it just happened to be the tool they had available when setting up the business. So we work with, for example, one, one in three brokered mortgages in Australia. We work with vehicle financing companies, commercial financing companies, anytime there's a large amount of customer paperwork that you need to collect. We have a portal solution designed to collect that information so that your customer gets a much better end user experience and you save a whole bunch of time not having to rename things and juggle them around and it goes straight in the CRM. I completely appreciate that use case. Now, I'd love to dive in a little bit into File Invite, but this word RevOps Manager or RevOps in general, I reckon is one of the least understood in sales. I agree. <laughs> so, how would you describe RevOps? It's stepping above just sales operations or marketing operations or CS operations to really understand not only what does what do the individual teams need, but how are they working well together? How are they using a common language? And by that, I mean, what when they're looking at data, they're looking at it in, in the same way so that the, the story is cohesive across the customer's journey. It's brilliant. And you had the benefit of helping File Invites expand internationally. Yes, I did. So File Invite was originally a tool that was built for a specific use case. We launched it thinking a whole bunch of web agencies were going to purchase it. And what we found actually was Australian mortgage brokers desperately needed the tool. And so after a couple of years operating in the Australian space, we decided we would take the platform to the USA. We set up a, an office in Colorado in Denver, and we went to talk to mortgage brokers in the US, only to really find that there were some other parts of the market over there that were better served by what we're offering. Interesting. So you're doing one in three mortgages in Australia. And what's the main ideal client profile over there? In the US, we're working with a number of different customers already. So we're working with a lot of people and our outbound focus at the moment is particularly on commercial financing. So that could be anything from a large multifamily tenanted apartment building to heavy equipment to vehicle leasing. We're also working a little bit in the education space. So one of our customers helps run about 120 different universities online education platforms. So there's a couple of places where we're very strong, particularly from an outbound focus, but the tool being fairly industry agnostic means that there's all sorts of interesting use cases that pop up from time to time. I reckon there aren't many professionals in your position that has seen a startup from New Zealand expand into Australia, expand into the US. And I'd love to dive into some of those differences. Yeah, there's certainly a few New Zealand firms out there now starting to get a footprint in the US, particularly in Colorado. The famous, more famous ones are being companies like Zero and Vend, but there's not a huge number. That's probably a, good, a correct statement. I think Zero is big enough that Australia's already <laughs> claimed it as their own. <laughs> okay, yeah. I obviously have a particular focus in outbounds. When you first set up your outbound operation, was that in New Zealand? Zealand or was that in the US? It was a little bit of a mix between the US and Australia. We don't do a lot in New Zealand. We, I think less than 4% of our revenue comes from New Zealand. So while we're New Zealand headquartered, it's not really a focus for us. And initially we probably tried a fairly similar approach in both markets and things evolved slightly from there. Okay. What would you say were some of the main differences between your Australian outbound and your American outbound? I think one of the biggest ones is probably volume. In Australia, we it's a much smaller market. We also have the advantage there of being a fairly known commodity, particularly in the mortgage broking space. So we can go to customers, knock on their door, even some of the banks and Chances are they've heard of File Invite, they know who we are. And even if we go outside of mortgage broking in Australia, there's going to be other, if someone's purchased a house in the last couple of years, there's a good chance they know, if not us in particular, the type of solution we offer. In America, it's a much bigger market. It's a lot less mature of a market. And we've got absolutely no name recognition there when we started off. A lot harder to knock down the doors of some of the larger organizations. What were some of the things that you tried there that maybe didn't work? I don't know if it's so much things that didn't work work. It's just where did we focus our energy and how did we focus our attention? In America, we use connect and sell a lot more aggressively. So we're attending a lot of events. We're getting contact lists of everyone who attends those events. 
and we're using those to start discussions. And so by using a tool like Connect and Sell, we can ring 100 people an hour per rep and speak with people that may have heard of us. We almost, we're talking with people across the spectrum there. So we're, we're, we're talking with people who have 10 users. We're talking with people who might have a couple of hundred users. Whereas in Australia, because we're a bit more of a known brand and we've got a comprehensive self-service product that can look after that lower end of the market. The smaller organizations can just go to our website, do a free trial. We're not targeting them quite as aggressively as we are in America where they haven't heard of us. We're being a little bit more strategic and we're talking to more of the bigger organizations there that have much longer sales cycles. There's so much there that I'd love to dig in, but a few of the interesting things you've brought up. I'll put Connect and Sell on the back burner for now, although I do want to dive in. You're mostly using Outbound your outbound team in conjunction with attending events, which would broadly fall under marketing. Is that because they've got you and they've clearly set up in a revenue operations? I've looked at revenue from a revenue perspective as opposed to a sales perspective and a marketing perspective. Is that how your outbound landed up being a function more of marketing than of sales? It still is a little bit more of a function of sales, I would say. It's quite interesting. What we've found is that the problem we solve is out there and it's always a discussion in organizations. Where do you put the SDR team? Is it in marketing? Is it in sales? They really are just knocking down the door and getting people to understand who we are and what we do. And so there's an argument to be made for putting it in either department. I think is having a RevOps team and function allows us to not really care who they report to, but more just care about what is the job they're doing and are they achieving that? The use case of your SDR team as going outbound to people who have attended an event or shown some kind of intent or interest, almost handling MQLs, so to speak, is a perfect use case and so often missed because they siloed in sales or marketing. But it's really fantastic to see success when yeah. it's done right. The, the place we're hoping to move to as well is getting a lot more PQL. So as we get more and more people using our self-serve product, we're finding some of those people are members and sometimes multiple people from the same organization. And that's, again, another easier way to start a conversation than a pure cold call. That was the second thing I wanted to discuss was you mentioned that you're moving to a product-led growth model for your, for your small to medium enterprise within Australia. How's that transition been from a pure sales play or pure marketing play to a product-led motion? Yeah, so we've always had a self-serve product that people can go and sign up for a free trial on. I suppose one of the things we probably haven't done a great job of in the past is identifying who on that who in that journey should be the ones we're reaching out to and so it's really just about becoming a little bit more mature about how we're measuring information on who's using our product how they're using our product and trying to surface the most relevant ones that we should who are the top 10 people we should call today that have actually heard about us that are actually using us as opposed to just going after everyone as if they were exactly the same yeah it's a we're seeing more of that as in, and it's maturing and it's fantastic to talk to professionals that are actively pursuing those kinds of that product intelligence to know how you can tie that into your revenue operations as opposed to just on registration or after six months who's actually getting yeah. impact. The tricky one to actually capture, if I'm honest, is uh, all of the people who are in the sales process for one of our larger accounts that are signing up on their Gmail accounts for a free trial just to poke around and see what's happening there. Ah, um, very interesting. So it does mean you have to treat everyone as if they are the most sure. important client in the room, regardless of what their email address looks like. Offline, I'll show you a great <laughs> way that you can go from private emails to people's LinkedIn address profiles because they usually use their private email address to sign up to LinkedIn. And then you'll be able to see where they work and work back down from there. I like it. Now, back onto that connect and sell. So you've got this really strong use case you have people attending your events, they potentially heard of your brand, maybe engaged in high level conversations. Your outbound team is then using connect and sell to engage with them at a very high velocity, presumably having a lot of conversations within the time that they're on the phone. Is that how it's working for you? That is. And what's interesting about that is while we were having a lot of conversations, we've actually made a slight change to the settings in Connect and Sell. So rather than connecting to the specific person that attended the event, we've actually opened it up a little bit so that now we just connect on live voice. And what that's allowing the team to do is talk to whoever answers the phone and potentially either get more information on the person they're trying to reach, or if they don't reach the person that went to the event, maybe even find out who a better person at the organization to approach is because one of the big challenges with the organization and the sales approach is that there's often not someone dedicated to looking after the area that we help solve it's like i imagine back in the day there was some poor person having to go knock on doors and say who looks after your fax machines and people going what's a fax machine we don't yeah. have anyone that looks after that we're all good thanks 
So I feel like we're a bit of a pioneer in a lot of organizations because there's no one who's responsible for the technology bit well, that we sit in. That makes sense. And you're probably a pioneer as well being revenue operations because that in itself is a pretty unique and new field. It is, yeah. And it's an exciting one to be in, I think, both uh, for sure. both being in a growing category of organization and a growing role within that the tech industry. Now, let's just talk, you, you mentioned the slight change in how you were using Connect and Sell as opposed to having their agents say, how oh, could I please speak to Brendan? It was just as soon as there was a Connect, they put your sales rep on with the person they were speaking to. Did you notice a change then in how many gatekeepers that you were getting through or intelligence you were generating on that through having a conversation with that gatekeeper? Yeah, so we speak to a slightly more people and we speak to a wider range of people. It's probably still slightly early days to draw any conclusions from it, but the team certainly feels even if the conversion rates might be slightly lower, which is to be expected when you're speaking to more people that are not the target person you're after, that it's not taking them too much longer to sit there, they're sitting there, they're having more conversations. So I think they enjoy that a little bit more as well. And the ability to gather intelligence on an organization so that the next time you ring up, you potentially already know, do they have the problem that we solve, which they should, because otherwise we shouldn't be calling them. And how are they currently collecting their documents? Hopefully we can answer that question. Most follow-up calls, we already know the answer to that question. The difference between volume and intelligence, right? Is that it's hard to take that away from the person. Would they all be documenting those conversations as well in a CRM? Because you're full tech stack enabled. They would. So we use Outreach as our sales engagement platform. And so all of the information from Connect and Sell will feed back into Outreach. Now, which CRM are you currently using? We're using HubSpot. Oh, I've got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> a lot of questions for you because obviously there's no native HubSpot outreach integration that also tracks activities. Correct. Has that been a pain point or not a problem? It's not too much of a problem because you can go back to the question of are the SDRs, are they marketing, are they sales? They're kind of pre full sales discussion. So they can use that to, to get their conversations and get us in front of the right people. As soon as we start to have those conversations with the right people and we're collecting some of the relevant information, we can start to then bring that stuff into HubSpot and we hand that over to the account executives and they work out of HubSpot. Those notes based on the intelligence that they've gathered from gatekeepers, maybe some of the people that they've spoken to who weren't the right people, do they then just manually upload all of that information, make a note as part of your handover? Where it's relevant, they do. Okay. Like, these are the things I love to see, right? Because there's no perfect solution. Right? No, there's not. And, and you, you definitely, without having that, that strong integration, you're definitely losing overview of some of the activity. One of the reasons we decided to move to a tool like HubSpot was that the marketing team was already using it. And one of the questions they could answer when they were using it was, if I run these two ads, which one's going to get me the most people clicking on it and coming through safe to a free trial and file invite? What they couldn't answer was not which ad is the most effective at getting people to click it, but of the two ads, which one's the most effective at getting to people to click it who are then going to go through the process yeah. and sign a deal and become paying customers. Because at the end of the day, we want to optimize for revenue generation and actually getting paying customers rather than just who's going to click on the pretty colors on the ad. Yeah, I love that focus on revenue and it's so important. One of the things that we've seen very often is outbound leading to inbound. I think it was this week, we sent a, an email off to a client for one of the major retailers in Australia, one of the, the billion dollar groups. And within 10 minutes of sending them a cold email, they visited the website, clicked on the request a demo and on our inbound lead. Would you be able to gain that intel and that insight without that integration? Or is it one of those things you don't really care as long as they're coming into the business? <laughs> we don't really care as long as they're coming into the business. So yeah, there, there can be an issue where sometimes there's you know, you're measuring too much or putting too much effort into measuring things when you could be putting more of that effort into targeting people better or doing better outreach or targeting the right people. We're all on the same team here, so we, we don't argue too much about whether that was created by marketing or created by sales. But we do like to jump into some of the individual deals and see exactly how they came in. It's Often where the conflict comes in is clearly from a business perspective, who cares? As long as this client is coming in and it's going to help generate revenue, our systems are working. Yes, you maybe want some intelligence into which part of the system is working better so you can make good financial decisions, but whether genuine conflict often comes in it's just through misaligned compensation packages does revops have a say in compensation i think we we have input when needed but not a direct say in compensation particularly not across teams so i've certainly had input into the sdr function and helped build out that function but the marketing team i've only recently started bringing them under my wing from a revops perspective amazing now i'd love to hear some of the differences between the u.s 
and Australia. Yeah, I think one of the biggest ones is when you ring someone up. In America, you can get away with saying things like, hi, this is Brendan from Fylandvai. Can I have 27 seconds? With, a, with, yeah. with the appropriately phrased chuckle. Yeah. In Australia, you're much better off just ringing up and saying, g'day, how's it going? Yeah, all of, I see so much of this advice on LinkedIn. Do it this way, do it this way, do it that way. And I was like, it just doesn't work here. It yeah. just, could you imagine calling somebody and saying, could I have 27 seconds of your time? <laughs> Look, I have done it and I, I have tested some of these things myself. I even quite liked Benjamin Dennehy's, hey, I, I want to be honest, this is a cold call. Do you want to hang up now or can I give you my elevator pitch or, or whatever? Yeah, you want? I think those all stem from a classic Sandler approach and all of these permission-based openers and at the moment, there's this huge push in the US, like death to permission based openers. <laughs> Whereas like in Australia, you could call up and say all of the fatal flaws in the US. You could phone <laughs> someone and say, hey, Brandon, I am calling from this company and I would like to talk to you about X, Y, Z. How's your day been? Like just the three classic failures within the opening lines and you could still have success here. Yeah. And I wonder too, how much of that, there's probably a combination of factors that have led to that. One is... I think some of the information you get on phone number databases is a little bit more comprehensive in the US depending on who you're using. And so I think you're getting through to cell phones a lot more often in the US. They're trying to decide if you're someone worth talking to a lot more than in Australia where the phone numbers aren't out there as much or they're not getting approached by as many people. So when someone rings them up, they're less likely to go, okay, who is this and do I need to hang up on them? And more likely to be like, oh, my phone's ringing. That hasn't happened in a while. Yeah, it's definitely a stronger sense of privacy here as well. They genuinely, uh, we get a lot more, how did you get my number in Australia? <laughs> in the US, nobody cares to ask how you got their number because they just yeah. assume everyone has their number. Yeah, it, it reminds me of Zuckerberg's senator. We sell ads. Yeah. The information's out there, guys. My latest, when they ask, how do we get your information? We just say the Optus leak. Yeah, actually, that's that, that's that's something a lot of our customers have been speaking about recently. Especially. Imagine so. You're collecting a lot of private and confidential information. You're a core part of that solution. Yeah, there's the Optus leak in Australia. And in the US, there's been some changes so that a lot more organizations are now being deemed to be financial services organizations. And so they're now subject to some legislation, which, depending on how you read it, indicates that sent, collecting customer information by email may not actually be legal anymore. So there's potentially some big wow. changes coming in the world. That, those tailwinds are going to support your business. Let's hope they will. Let's hope that does come through. Yeah. It's something that I think it's a part of many people's businesses that they haven't paid attention to. I think similar to when you're talking about talking to someone in RevOps, sometimes things get done for a particular department just because that's the way they've always been done. And I can see file invites as a solution kind of fits into people's business in the same way. They've always collected information by email. Yeah. Not because anyone told them to, but when they showed up for work and they needed to get the information, send me an email has always just been there in the back of your head. Of course, unless this is a strategic implementation from above saying this is how we collect, no different to sharing passwords. Unless you've been just specifically told you will use this password management system within our organization, everyone will default to how they've always done it. Yeah, and it's leading to humongous losses for many organizations around the world as they suffer the consequences of breaches and, uh, and other nefarious actors. Yeah, and I could imagine the friction to purchase as well is often just too big. Right? Yeah. If I had to, I'd, we once filled in, there's a system in Australia that you, renters will often use and they want, it's just such a painful process, right? So if you're helping with that's pretty amazing. Tell me data. You mentioned there's a lot more access to data in the US than in Australia. Have you looked for different data providers or have you found that they're all quite similar in this region? We've used a few different ones and they're broadly similar. There are a few regional differences, I think, between some of the different tools. And I think the prob we've settled on the ones we're using for the time being based on our requirements and the way we're going after the slightly different markets in a different manner. Now cultures of the team are you employing new zealanders in the u.s or have you found local team members we have some local coloradians cultural differences i think one of the biggest ones that if you're moving to the u.s from apac that you should be aware of is that america is a much more litigious country and so just bearing that in mind as you make decisions it's always important to hire the right people and know that there are different legislative requirements and abilities to operate businesses in different ways depending on the state you're operating in and you do always need to be mindful that you don't want to be sued yeah i imagine the legal landscape or HR in particular in Australia would be quite different too? Yeah, so we don't actually hire anyone directly in Australia. We operate out of New Zealand. So yeah, there's 
not much I've learned there. It's all stuff that I've known from living here for many years. I think New Zealand would be pretty similar to Australia in that regard, or in most regards. It is pretty similar. The staff are looked after, which is an amazing thing. You're accountable in many which ways, but there there isn't that same risk that you have in the US where you could be sued for everything, yeah. <laughs> where these threatens on a daily basis. Um, and I think the US colleagues enjoy the fact that because we are from New Zealand, we've probably got slightly more lenient leave policies. We've recently introduced a wellness day. So once every quarter, we give the entire company the day off so that no one's uh, trying to book a meeting with you. It helps to have everyone taking the same day off. And you can really spend a day just to focus on yourself and unwind because working in a startup it is quite a high pressure environment. And we're often rushing to get too many things done all at once, conscious that we can't boil the ocean. So you need to step back, focus on what are the important things that are going to move the needle and having some time off to go to the beach and relax can sometimes help with that. Absolutely. And I've worked with a few New Zealand startups and I absolutely love the cultures, particularly how it relates to sales. That's what I'm exposed to. And I think in general, the culture, the sales culture in New Zealand is far more enjoyable to be a part of than let's just say some of the cultures in San Francisco. I imagine that's true. And I think one of the things too that's helping to is bleeding over from New Zealand into the US is our sales culture. We try and treat sales as a team sport here because it's never just you doing the deal. And if it is, you probably should be told off because there's probably a point during in the sales process where you should be bringing in someone to have a chat with our head of product or a revenue director or one of our tech guys on API integrations. And if you've done it all by yourself, it's probably not a good thing. Absolutely. Now, what's next? What's next for your sales team? What are the big challenges that you're currently trying to solve? That's a good question. I think it's a little bit of more of the same. We've had a really good year of growth in the US. We've grown 100% year on year. So if we can just continue that momentum, I think we'll all be pretty happy. And if you were to give some advice to sales leaders that are looking to take their business over to the US, what would be some of the top level lines of advice you'd give? Yeah, I think it's probably talk to the people who can help you because they've either been there before or that's their job. So there's a number of New Zealand software companies that are setting up base in the US and Colorado in particular, there's quite a lot. And there's also organizations like New Zealand Trade and Enterprise who can help you with beachhead advisors and other advisors because they've helped many companies go through similar processes in the past. So broadly, community and ecosystem. Yeah, try and do it all yourself. There's people who have been there and done it before, lean on them. That's really sage advice. And if you were to give any advice to US-based sales leaders that are looking to open up their APAC region or their ANZ region in particular. Talk to Ricky. He's probably a good... Uh, <laughs> That's not why you're on here, but I'll send you a, I'll send you a check soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I think understanding the different culture that we have in this part of the world, which is a little bit more laid back, a little bit more relaxed, or at least appears that way. It doesn't mean that's always true, but we come at things a little bit softer, especially to start with. Amazing. Now, to end off, if you could just help describe your ideal customer profile or the pain point that anyone listening to this that might be experiencing, that if they are experiencing that pain, they should probably seek out your advice or file invite support. If you are collecting multiple documents as part of any onboarding process, whether that's onboarding new customers, new staff, and you're doing that by email, you need to get onto file invite, sign up for a free trial, fileinvite.com, and the rest will take care of itself. There are hours every week wasted by your team organizing documents, dragging them out of inboxes, renaming them, getting them in the right format. We can automate all of that. I know we spoke before about integrating tools like Outreach and HubSpot. There's some really cool stuff you can do once you start to automate things like document collection. So for example, we're working with a company called Fortero in Australia. They've got an automatic fraud detection system. So you can upload your documents into, the customer can upload their documents into File Invite. Now that we've got those in a proper digital system, we can integrate other tools like Fortero and scan them for fraudulent activity and return those documents to you, not just as documents you now have, but documents that have been checked for fraudulent activity. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff like that you can do once you start digitizing your systems properly and not just having them electronic. Nothing seems more relevant for this day and age with people working from home and you're relying heavily on digital documentation yeah. for proof. If anyone's listening has those challenges, definitely head over to the website, give it a try and let me know what the sales experience is and I'll be able to send that feedback through to Brendan. 
Absolutely. As always, it's a work in progress. It always is. I saw a picture the other day of the past and the present. And the past was, I really feel like I don't know what I'm doing. And the present <laughs> is, I know that everyone feels like they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. It's probably an real. accurate description. It's been a real absolute pleasure chatting to you. And I'm sure anyone listening to this is going to get a lot of benefit from it. And I'd love to have a chat with you again sometime soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks for being on.